Thank you so much for being on the show, Valid. Oh, no problem. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, well, you are certainly one of the most productive uh, and also one of the most vocal uh, proponent of natural language um, understanding. You have written prolifically about on uh, the topic on your medium as well as um, talked on a different podcast about that. But let's kick off with your main assertion. Uh, what is natural language understanding and these bifurcation you talk about in your papers on ontological and logical concepts? Um, what is the main idea to, for the dummies? Uh, so if you can make it easier for that. I know it's kind of hard task for an intellectual like you, but no, 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 let's it's, do that. Uh, no, actually, it's not that complicated. Uh, as uh, many great thinkers uh, said, if you can't explain it very simply, then very simply you don't understand it. So uh, it's no, it's not that complicated. Uh, the yeah, I've been uh, uh, obsessed actually with uh, language understanding since my grad studies in AI. Um, so the main thing that I think people miss uh, in in work in language uh, is they uh, they really dis especially uh, the recent uh, 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 the, the, the recent uh, data driven uh, runaway train I call it um, they they uh, they do not associate language with the mind as much as they should be I mean language is the only uh, uh, or the, the most uh, uniquely uh, human thing, really, I mean, uh, among uh, all living species. Uh, and that's not a, a trivial uh, thing, like uh, uh, the, the human brain is not a lot different from the brain of chimpanzees biologically. Uh, it's different, of course, we have more neurons and way, but, but the the, 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 the difference is not as much as the difference between us and them in terms of cognition and thinking. And language is a big part of that. So when people look at language as pixels in an image or as uh, audio sounds in speech, or basically when they look at language like it's data, they're missing a lot. They're, they're, they're really, uh, uh, not not going to tackle the real problem. Uh, and one of the manifestations of this is they equate natural language processing, which is really text processing, where the text is language, uh, and with language understanding. Language understanding is a different beast altogether. Uh, uh, in, in language processing, I can live with uh, approximate results or results that are uh, consistent with the machine learning paradigm, which is the PAC learnability. PAC stands for probably approximately correct. Uh, so in, in, in NLP, I can do a lot of stuff that don't have to be uh, absolutely correct. I can do summarization, who said that the summarization of this engine is better than this? The result is subjective and not objective. I can extract the key topics. Who said the topics extract, extracted by your engine are better than mine? So the, the NLP, you could use data-driven machine learning approaches because the answer is subjective and it's based on similarity. And, and that's really what's underneath machine learning in the end similarity of word embeddings or the, the, the best you can do is similarity or the most that you can do. Language understanding is different. Language understanding is about uh, understanding, obviously, the thought behind some utterance or some, uh, whether it's written or speech. It's really understanding the exact thought that a human is trying to convey. And that's what makes it difficult because when we communicate, we assume a lot. I assume a lot about any human being. They should know basic naive physics of how the world works and what makes sense and what doesn't. 
All of that is assumed in our communication and we leave it out. We don't say it. So because machines don't know what we all know, it's hard for them to decode our messages uh, and uncover or discover really all the missing information that is implicitly assumed. Uh, so I don't know, I, I, it, it probably is a long uh, uh, introduction to why NLU is something that I feel passionately about and I'm uh, uh, and I try on my medium blog or in articles that I write and sometimes in papers although lately I haven't had time to write papers I try to uh, uh, press this point that what we're doing now is not really language understanding it has very little if anything in some cases to do with language understanding we're doing a lot of text processing, sure, but language understanding is, is quite different. I think it's a good segue into your remarks about um, GPT-3. Um, only yesterday they have launched their uh, Codex platform, uh, which takes natural language instructions um, to develop code. Um, based on uh, what their needs are and it's very limited in, in its performance and you have talked earlier about um, the performance of GPT as a natural language processing engine which is uh, way off when it comes to human baseline because you have talked about the fact that um, natural language processing is probably the only AI um, tool um, that performs under human baseline. For example, if you take tabular data and you can do credit and regression and classification um, analysis on data, that would be way better than any human being um, would be able to do it from a mental faculty. But when it comes to natural language think, the processing, that's way off than a human baseline. What do you think um, is wrong with our mathematical models or our algorithms that is not giving us near human um, accuracy, or do you think that it's not even possible? And if it's not possible, I mean, what, are, what is that engine that you're working on and how is that going to be better? Okay, a couple of uh, very important questions. Uh, I'll get to what I'm working on later. Uh, no, there, there is, I, I am a strong believer that we could do human level understanding of language. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, I work in the field, otherwise I would uh, choose another career. No, I, I believe we can. Uh, now, the, the thing about when we do analytics, you're right, I mean, we can, um, we can do predictions and analytics that, that no human can even come close to doing. Uh, so, I mean, but that's computational science. I mean, it's, uh, and, uh, and this is not new. I mean, uh, when, we, when we designed the calculator, uh, we knew that machines can beat us at many things. A calculator now that is uh, not even worth one dollar can do arithmetic that no human can do. I mean, right? So I'm not sure why people are surprised that machines can do stuff that we can't do. Uh, I mean, uh, bulldozers can lift more than us. So okay, machines we know can do things that no human can do. Even, even mental things, like I said, I mean, uh, a calculator can do arithmetic and square root and flo floating point arithmetic uh, that no human being can come close to, right? Uh, and of course, with, with computation, we can do a lot of stuff that no human can do. But uh, language is, is quite different because really language, again, I, I emphasize this point. Uh, even game playing, I mean, we beat chess, we beat, uh, we conquered chess, we conquered Go, which is a, uh, orders of magnitude more complex than chess, just because of the search space is, is I mean, amazingly large. Uh, but, but these are all, uh, these are mostly processes that are brute force. They require just more compute power or need algorithms that can conquer them. When it comes to language, the, 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 the real difference or unique about it, not because I work in language, I, 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 it's the other way around. I work in language because it is that unique. Um, language is really tightly related to the mind, to common sense reason, really understanding 
is is a human thing, is a uniquely human thing. Uh, to mechanize it, uh, you have to get into issues that are uh, related to cognition, to reasoning, to uh, how we uh, see the world, what makes sense. Language is all of those things together. Uh, and uh, anytime you look at language like another data problem that can be conquered by traditional computation, uh, you, you are missing the point. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's the, we, we will just not uh, conquer language by just looking at the text itself. Because a lot of what's needed for language understanding is not in the data. It's not even in the data, right? Uh, and th there's a there's an analogy in image uh, in scene understanding actually, but it's not as difficult as the language problem. So, for example, the best image recognition system can can identify uh, a a, a female adult from a male adult, right? Or a, or a, or a horse from a uh, a donkey, which is not easy actually. But can they recognize the difference between? And I actually made this challenge in one of my posts, and uh, nobody has taken uh, up this challenge. Uh, the, the so the challenge would have images like an image of a mall and an image of a university campus, right? Uh, can, can a, a four-year-old, if you give them a picture of a mall and a picture of a, of, a, of a campus, of a university campus, they can easily identify this is a college, this is a shopping center. Uh, although the objects in both are the same, you will have trees and grass and people, people holding bags and stuff. But there's some, there, the information you require to identify, the, to, to, to really uh, uh, identify the, the, the campus from the mall are things that are not in the data. Okay? So the same in language. Uh, or, or you can identify an adult female from, uh, uh, from an adult male, but can you identify uh, a, uh, a teacher in the image? There are some subtle information that have to do with reasoning. Uh, that, so for example, uh, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, you might see an adult female with children, right? But there's some subtle information that are not in the, in, in the data itself that allow you to reason that this cannot be a mother. Like no, no mother can be the mother of 20 kids that are all of the same age and they are different uh, of different races and so on. That is reasoning that's not in the data. The data is just a hint. And then there is reasoning that has to go on. Same in language, but multiplied even by, uh, I mean, even a lot more complex. The data, the text itself is just a hint as to what is being said. There, uh, a lot of the information needed in the end to do the full grasping or comprehension is not in the text itself. Uh, I'm not sure I, I answered the question, but the, uh, the, the there's, there's, a, there's a lot in in the understanding that's not in the data the data itself needs another uh, structure that we all have that will fill in all the missing information that's not in the data itself so in many ways doing just purely data driven language processing you're looking for something that's not even there i mean i can give you many examples uh, I say Mary enjoyed the, the sandwich. I didn't tell you that she uh, enjoyed eating it, right? But we all know that the missing information here is Mary apparently ate a sandwich. If I say Mary enjoyed the movie, 
I didn't. I don't mean she enjoyed directing the movie or producing it. We all know Mary enjoyed watching the movie. So you're looking for something that's not even in the data. Right? Um, one of the questions that might arise um, from your premise that there's a subcontext that machines won't be able to figure out is the fact that if GPT-3 or any of other um, transform transformer models uh, spit out an output um, that you wanted to um, search from the corpus um, to you, it's again human beings who are going to be interpreting that information and you know they would fill in the subcontext that you were expecting machines to actually fulfill for you so i mean do you see in the end the bigger picture yeah, is yeah, the... yeah. Uh, although although i'm sorry to interrupt you but no if 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 uh, gpt3 could be good at spitting out some text generating text okay but uh and, and so it basically it's like a Google search, right? You, I, I give you results and we end up doing the search, right? So we, we end up doing the understanding. Okay, that, that, that's fine. But the ultimate test, here, here's the test. And, and I keep telling my colleagues and, and uh, friends that, it, uh, I mean, it, we should wonder like why if, if GPT-3, I mean, if, if you read, I tested GPT-3, we can talk about it technically, what it's doing and, and what, it, it's, uh, what it claims to be doing, which it's not true, but we can get to that later. But I keep wondering and asking colleagues and friends, like when you read these articles about GPT-3, human level language, but okay, why, why haven't something like GPT-3 did a small demo, right? You have, a, let's say a database of, uh, I don't know, animals or a database on touristic locations to uh, vacationing in Europe, right? Tourism in Southeast Asia, whatever. Some database, right, that has information or geography, rivers and mountains and whatever, some database. And allow people to ask questions in plain English. Small challenge, right? So wh what they do is they try to impress people by you put a prompt and it gives you text that is related to it uh, that is coherent and yeah they do a good job here and, and it's a simple trick really well not very simple but uh, or they find you relevant code it's it's a big search engine that's what that's what gpt3 is there's no understanding at all right the ultimate test for language understanding and you have all these benchmark squad and blah 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 which are really a joke you want to test language understanding, it's very simple. We can all agree on a standard database, geography, right? Uh, what is the second largest city in, in India or, or uh, what is the most populous capital in the world? Like whatever, right? Okay, that's not a big deal. We can create a nice database we, got, we all agree on. And let's see if you can allow people to ask questions and engage in a dialogue to get them the answer. Very simple. Nobody dares to do that. You know why? Because understanding is different from generating. I can generate anything that looks decent for you. Uh, I mean, because technically it's easy. If, if you allow me to read billions of words, right? And I can figure out similarity between them. You give me a prompt. It's basically a gigantic search, a hash table where you're doing search and you're saying, okay, uh, what you give me, what you gave me seems to be similar to this it correlates well with this so I start spinning stuff that I saw before that's it I'm, 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 uh, trust me that's it technically there's nothing more happening here um, let's talk about a specific case actually um, word has seen um, and you know they're very enamored with this um, AI uh, technological um, breakthroughs, which um, for me is kind of hilarious. I don't know if you have heard about the robot Sophie, um, who yep. actually yeah. addressed the United Nations, and you know Saudi Arabia for some weird reason gave it a nationality also. Um, and he had a she had a conversation with Tony Robbins, which seemed quite coherent. But I was just wondering, um, back to your point, it looks like a big hash tables do you think that she would be able to answer tricky questions or understand metaphors or aphorisms um, I mean, why do you think do you think people get carried away because it's someone says it's technologically breakthrough or it's simple naivety or just a seduction of uh, knowing something new 
Right. There, there are many factors. One of them is commercialism, the big factor. I mean, AI has been taken over by the tech giants. And, you know, you, you, now everything is big and deep and deep mind and deep that, everything. There's no shallow anymore. There's no small. It's big and deep. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of commercialism. Uh, there's a, and there's, na, uh, there's naivete too. I mean, people, uh, especially young generations, you know, they take a couple of Coursera courses when they think, and it's cool, you know, AI, machine learning, hey, you know. A uh, new term, data science. I, I never thought we need a new science. I mean, computer science is about data science, information science, and knowledge science. Why did we create a new phrase? I don't know. Uh, data science is, is essentially computational statistics. That's all it is, right? But okay, we like the new term data science and we equate that with machine learning and we equate all of that with AI. So AI now is just machine learning and specifically deep learning. Like, excuse me? AI is a lot more, uh, but uh, the reason for that is many reasons. There's, like I said, commercialism is a big factor. Uh, and unfortunately, academia got into the commercial. I'm not going to leave any friends probably after this, but. Uh, <laughs> I think but, the count uh, is quite low as it is. <laughs> as it is, yeah, yeah. But that's fine. I, I'm a passionate guy and I speak my mind. Um, the Even academia got into the commercial mm. uh, uh, greed of this. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, big name schools. I mean, they're offering courses and, 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 and they're making young kids believe that if you take a couple of courses, you know, AI, I mean, AI is the probably going to be the lar the, the last field of science that human, that we can conquer because there's a, there's a circularity in the science. We're trying to understand ourselves. I mean, there's, there's a self-reference. It will probably, I mean, I can dissect biological stuff, but the mind is trying to understand the mind. This will be the last uh, thing science will conquer. And you're telling a kid that if they take two courses uh, from an Ivy League school, they know AI, a subject that has been studied from before Aristotle and, and Plato and Socrates. I mean, it, 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 it's about thinking and reasoning and the evolution of the human mind. It's about psychology and cognition. And it's, it's about knowledge. How do we represent knowledge? We don't have a clue, right? How do we, our memory, how do we retrieve, how do we store stuff? When, I, when a child knows how to recognize the banana, right? What do they store inside? I mean. We, we have no clue. And yet you have people saying, hey, in three months, I can make you an AI expert. Like, excuse me? Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a field of science where the most penetrating minds in the history of logic and mathematics and psychology, they were famous just by understanding a small aspect of the mind. And now you can become an AI expert in three months. So that, there's a lot of forces that are negative that are happening. Commercialism, hyping. The media is not innocent. The media writes stuff that, my God, it's like I wrote an article years ago that uh, <laughs> um, it's like someone waking up from a coma and reading all these headlines in the media and, and, and thinking AI is here. Like, that's how I felt when I read these uh, headlines. And, Computers, uh, computer programs that think better than a human. That's one headline. What? My, my three-year-old is smarter than the most advanced <laughs> technology. That's, I mean, what, what are we talking about? So there's media hype. There's commercial hype, commercially driven hype. Even from academia, like I said, there's, uh, I don't know, too many things. But what made it happen, you know, there's, everything has a historical reason behind it. All of a sudden, we had lots of data, tons of data because of the uh, web. We're, we're, a, we're a village now, really. We're connected and we're communicating. I mean, the, the amount of content that's put online every, as we speak, probably 200,000 videos were uploaded to YouTube and, and, and probably, I don't know how many messages on Twitter uh, uh, have just been added globally. 
So lots of content. We're creating content and exchanging it like crazy, right? And computing power at the same time, uh, there were advances, I mean, that were tremendous. I mean, the laptop I have now, when I started computer science, if I take the spec of this laptop to my school when I started computer science, I'm an old guy. Uh, it would be uh, qualified as a supercomputer, and I'm not joking. It would have been when I started my computer science education, the specs of this machine would have been classified as a supercomputer, right? So computing power progressed tremendously with lots of data. So we said, let's analyze this data and hooray, the big data, uh, we're in the big data revolution. And so empirical sciences, statistical sciences took over the field of the AI. And it was easy to, you know, we call it picking up the low hanging fruits. It was easy to get some stuff from data, right? ImageNet came and a new, a new uh, reincarnation of neural networks of the 80s came, which is essentially the same, by the way. Okay, we called it now deep learning because we can put more layers. It did well on ImageNet and that's it. It took over like crazy. But to tell you the truth, which very few people will tell you, probably, there has been very little progress in AI, substantially, conceptually. Very little. All that happened is we have more compute power and more data that we can get something out of it that we wouldn't be, we, we, we were not able to 20 years ago even. That's all that happened. Nothing new under the sun, by the way. I was just wondering, wh why is that? I mean, coming from a social science background, we do a lot of behavioral psychology work with um, pipelines. It, it seems like, you know, it's fairly, very easy to understand where you're coming from. When I read your Medium blog post, you know, it, it's an open challenge for people to actually create a model and, you know, give you results that actually beat human baseline. And no one's able to actually do that. And one of the things um, with the um, AI circle is that which for for which I admire you a lot is that you're probably one of the you know sane headed people who, who you know take things at face value and you know talk about realistic things without you know getting um, on the wave of uh, you know fashionable ideas. So you've spoken uh, about uh, AI leaders like Jan Lacun, uh, especially the paper about uh, building the whole language model from the out characters. Which is, I mean, I mean, you give tell it to a five year old, and you know, she's going to give you a laugh as well. I mean, for example, and I think much of that is sponsored by Facebook also. But do you think that you have lost personally, or, or, uh, um, yeah, you know, so a lot of criticism for choosing a different path based on facts and not what's fashionable? I mean, I do see a lot of criticism, but none of that comes with objective solutions or a better model, but from the fact that you know maybe it's a too uh, complicated philosophical gibberish that this guy is trying to make. No, okay, uh, okay. Two things here. I it's it's one thing to criticize to 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 point out what's wrong, but then you have an alternative, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But but the first thing, the first thing we should do is say this is wrong, because it's it's a waste of resources and time. And I, in my mind, we're gonna look back. Uh, I don't know uh, when this crazy runaway train will be more sane. At least I'm not saying. We should stop this paradigm. I mean, every paradigm should be pursued because we never know what will come out from something, right? But this extreme extremism, this cultism, uh, uh, deep and big and deep and big, and that's it. That's the only way we can think about AI. Is silly, right? I mean, uh, back propagation and stochastic gradient descent as an optimizing algorithm, which is like a twenty-line algorithm will explain the human mind. I mean, are, are we nuts? Are we nuts? That's what deep learning is. And the rest is more computing power, right? A, a couple of activation functions and a, and a back propagation algorithm will explain how the mind works. Are we nuts, right? Uh, okay, so it's one thing to criticize and I like to point out things like, hey guys, especially to the new generation that's, you know, they, you know, those guys on LinkedIn, they have, ML slash AI slash they're experts in everything now. So okay, especially those guys, they should know that hey guys, you're working in the in a field of science 
that we have been thinking about since we have been thinking, right? So take it easy, right? And point out the, you mentioned Lacoon had a paper that we can learn language just from characters, even. not only text, data, words, from characters. I mean, I don't know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm baffled by, by statements like this from, for all practical purposes, a very brilliant guy, I don't know, you know, he's a, he's a long time researcher in, in AI, but, or, or Jeff Hinton when he said a couple of months ago, or probably a bit more, that deep learning will soon be able to do everything. Whoa, hold on. And, and actually I point them to, to criticism that was done in the mid eighties that proved that proved that this paradigm is good for one thing, pattern recognition only, only, which means predicting from tons of data, uh, making a, uh, uh, discovering a manifold that covers all this data and hopefully unseen data. So it learned what these types of patterns are all about. That's good, it's a powerful technology, I'm not saying no, but to equate that with the human mind and reasoning, uh, and and I'm not the only one. There were others pointing out that, hey guys, you know, I mean, I should this, point here. I think it's uh, uh, appropriate if you, time. If you look, if, if you look at sorry, but self-driving uh, uh, cars. If you look at the big flaw that's happening in autonomous driving, and it cost us billions of dollars uh, because they wouldn't listen that that image recognition is not enough. When we drive, we do complex reasoning, guys. Right? We do very complex reasoning that we're not always aware of, but we do complex reasoning. It's not just about the visual aspect. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, but I was just mentioning one of the papers that John Lacuna and Benji um, wrote, and which was very, very surprising. For example, it's uh, the pro the proposition in the paper called scaling learning algorithms towards AI was um, the fact that you know there are algorithms that can appro approximate the artificial general intelligence, which is such a um, blatant statement without any qualification at all. I mean, what exact spheres can we apply these statements? So, like you rightly said, you know, it would be a very good tool for um, prediction um, in regression or classification um, right. problems where data is tabular and structural. But when it comes right. to NLP, the uh, performance is so bad that you don't even know where to start. And I was just wondering, why is that the leaders like this who are certainly very brilliant in other areas are trying to you know jump on this it's bandwagon true. is it money is it fame or it, it, because we uh, would expect people from in that position to be at least honest and you know educate people to be realistic and not actually right. abuse it for, if i may use the word for our own benefit and i, I think that's not right it's uh, it's even uh, i it's an excellent point and that's really what's driving me to keep writing. Uh, it's even unethical. It's even immoral. It's even immoral to, to lure a generation of young kids on the wrong path. Also, as a, as a society, as humanity, we're wasting time and billions of dollars on something. Now, I don't know if they know they're not telling the truth. This is a big statement. That would be really immoral. Are they that passionate and they just defy scientific? I'll give you an example where they're, I, I'm shocked, I'm baffled more than you actually. They're like these guys must know basic mathematics and basic reasoning and basic logic. So he, here's one thing I, I just wrote an article about uh, machine learning and language understanding that they are incompatible, right? I mean, we know mathematically, it has been proven that machine learning is equivalent to compression. Learnability is equivalent to compressibility. And it makes sense if you, if you know how these systems work. Basically, you cannot learn anything from the data if the data is not full of redundancies and is compressible. It has to be highly compressible because that's what learning is doing. It's taking tons of data and covering all of them in a continuous manifold that summarizes all of them. So in a sense, it's a compression technique, right? And it's, uh, but, but, Regardless of the intuition behind it, uh, it has been proven. So it's, this is not my opinion. It has been mathematically proven. And it's if and only if, in other words, they're equivalent, right? This is this. Learning is doing nothing but compressing, okay? A data set. Okay, 
language understanding, we know, is about uncompressing. Is about actually discovering what was missed and not implicitly assumed and not stated in the text explicitly. That's it. That's a mathematical proof that learn that ML has nothing to do with language understanding, because actually, in fact, they are contradicted. One is about compressing, one is about actually uncompressing. So you and and you you wanna you wanna define mathematics and logic? Okay, then you know you can always say I, I believe two plus two is six. You know, that's my, okay, good for you, but we belong to different planets, right? There's ample proof in many ways what the limitation of this approach is. Actually, there's a classic paper by Jerry Forder and uh, Zenon Pilishin that was, I think, 88. I think you read a medium blog about that also. Yeah, and, and they proved, uh, they proved that this, uh, this paradigm cannot capture intentional properties. Intentional properties are properties that are, uh, you know, I, I discuss intention with the young generation now. They say what? They, they keep writing it in T. They never read intention with an S. I say this is different from intention as what is my intent? This is a mathematical notion. And basically it has to do with, I'll give a simple example. Uh, three plus five is eight, but so is four plus four, right? So these two objects, but it can apply to any other object. So these two objects are equal by value only. They're not equal generally. No, they're two different objects, right? Eight is not the same as three plus five. They're two different objects. They're equal in one attribute on their value, but they have other attributes. And, and, and neural networks cannot deal with this because they don't have structural information. Right, mm. uh, and that's why they can always be adversarially attacked. By the way, because when you compose tensors in a neural network, you lost the structure, you lost the components. When you do a linear combination of one or more vector into one vector, you lost the original components. There is no syntactic structure in neural networks. You lost the components. It, it's it's a long uh, technical uh, issue, but it it has been proven that these models are very limited when it comes to domains where the data uh, is discrete and needs structure and needs uh, 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 needs intentional properties. Well, one of the questions that might arise here um, from your subcontext uh, part of the natural language processing, and I don't know if I've come across any post, including yours, um, that might be a component of the larger model that could make our understanding better, which is the nonverbal component um, of um, our communication. For example, 93% of uh, communication can be nonverbal in many contexts. Um, for example, um, if I say um, a sentence, what tone was that? Was it sarcastic? Was it um, ex excitement? Was it um, gloomy? Was it sad? And you know, when you right. do transcription using the um, APIs for Google Translate or Amazon, it wouldn't actually help you to capture those nuances in the language. So computer models would take it literally and you know spit out the results based on um, what was inputted. And that would be totally disaster. Um, and I'm just wondering right. if, if there's a way to incorporate uh, those um, nonverbal cues. And um, one of the things that I've, um, the papers that actually I've read talk about the prosody of the voice, but there's no mathematical evidence that this can be translated into a measurable a construct that would be helpful in boosting the accuracy overall. Can, do you, have you read or have you experimented with that component of the communication? Right. Uh, okay, uh, this is a huge subject because it has to do with uh, communication in general, not, not, not just formal language communication. Uh, you're right, there's metaphor, irony, sarcasm, uh, we use, uh, and actually we, language is so rich that we use it to our advantage uh, in politics to be vague, uh, in comedy we use surprise, I mean, it, it's a, it, it's very complex as a, as a bigger problem. Uh, I, I'm interested in all those subjects, but my, my current interest is more of an engine, uh, of, of, the engineer, the, the practical side of things like, okay, before all these big complex problems are solved, 
And by the way, language has a lot to do with even uh, how we acquire and uh, acquire new knowledge and make our uh, make inferences for even predictions. So sometimes statements have implications behind them, even if you fully understood it. There's a process that goes on after, which is your own interpretation of things, and and it's based on your psychological state, and so it's a very complex thing. But what I'm interested in now is, hey guys, before we make these big claims, can we make a a, a practical language understanding system? So, for example, one that can be used to do question answering uh, by voice to database. Like you know, you have a you have a VP or an executive in a company. They get their phone, they select the database HR, and they say, "How many salespeople we have on vacation in the Chicago branch?" Can we get that at least, right? But in in the long uh, in, in the long term, language is a, is a, you're right. There are so many aspects of language that we don't even understand right now. We have some understanding of metaphor. We, there are computational models for metaphor. Uh, there are some uh, for metonymy, for example, which is sort of related to metaphor, but not quite. And how good are uh, those but, models? Sorry? How good are those models? I mean, you talk about the 10 uh, parts of NLU in one of your blog posts also. And I'm just yeah. wondering how, what does the accuracy uh, look like? Well, after uh, I've been working on, on this for 20 years and I, uh, I think I, I have a system that explains those. Uh, that's something we can get into maybe some other time, but I'm working on a system that uh, handles all these problems. Uh, and one of them is actually uh, uh, another mystery about language. I don't know if you know about the adjective. I mentioned it in one of my blogs, I think. It's called the adjective ordering restriction mystery. It was a mystery for linguists for many years. But I got so obsessed with it because it is a, a, a phenomena that is not specific to any language. So I got really interested in it because it told me what's happening here can tell us something about how language works in our mind, the internal language, because it's not a, it's not a phenomena specific to any language. Basically, it has to do with when we have more than one adjective. It seems that we always order them in a in a natural way that we don't know why. Like uh, there's no rule, there's no rule that we know of that says if I have beautiful and red, I should say beautiful red, not red beautiful. So I don't say John bought a red beautiful car. We all say John bought a beautiful red car. Like we don't, and we don't know why, right? And apparently it has to do with, uh, uh, it, it's an internal thing. It's not an English or Chinese or French thing. Uh, so th there are so many puzzling things about language. The, I, I do have a system that has solved these problems and other so-called semantic riddles or paradoxes. And then I knew at some point when one of one after the other was like there were many eureka moments, but I knew I have something here because it can't be an accident that this thing is solving all these problems. And by the way, it turned out that the system underneath language is a lot simpler than we all than we ever imagined. And it, how it, it's, it's, I just, a, it's consistent with you, uh, you got me curious yeah. there, and I was just wondering how is that radically different from uh, Noam Chomsky's universal grammar. Uh, it's uh, different in uh, in one sense in that the emphasis is not on the grammar, the challenge is not the grammar, it's the ontological structure underneath. Th there's an ontological structure that's implicit in all our linguistic communication. And, and that structure has to be discovered, not invented. People have tried to, do, to build these ontological structure. And it turned out to be much simpler than we ever thought. No wonder four-year-olds can talk forever with you, right? And they don't have any domain knowledge to speak of. They can hardly open the door, but they speak fluently. So the ontological structure that seems to underlie language, that's beneath language, has had to be discovered. So my emphasis is on the 
ontological structure that's underneath language that has to be discovered. And it's language neutral, by the way. Then we have the external uh, that is, you know, English, French, Danish, Indian, uh, Hindi, whatever, Chinese. Okay. So, but all of uh, all of those languages, underneath them is an I language. Chomsky calls it the I language, the internal language. But he puts the focus on the grammatical uh, rules, while the emphasis is really on the semantic and ontological typing of the system. Uh, and I'm just wondering, could it be a fact that based on this universal grammar, you can extract entities um, from the passage um, or the conversation? And then, and I'm just kind of uh, running wild here and thinking about, you know, what could be the possible way to um, gain those semantic origins uh, from the passage? And I'm just wondering, I, I know that you are commercially pursuing that, but, you know, just to get the um, idea that, I mean, what, what would make it um, substantially different? Um, from current models that we have, and there are certainly communities who are working in, uh, in trying to understand what could be um, a possible way in, in way that wouldn't be specific to one language. Right. Uh, you, you can do something now with current approaches, but there's a limit to how much that can scale. I mean, it's, they're very limited what you can do now. And as of now, there's, to my knowledge anyway, there is no system that can read broad text and extract from it a knowledge graph or, or populate a knowledge graph, if you want. There's no such thing. Uh, you can do some of that. I mean, uh, ontologic, the, the, the effort I'm working on, uh, uh, we can extract right now some obvious relations easily. But there's a limit how much you can do if unless you do full, full comprehension, real understanding, exactly like we do when we read something, we understand it fully. And then after we digest it all collectively, then you can ask me questions about it because now it has been converted into an internal knowledge graph, if you want, that I can query, right? So you can ask me questions. But nothing exists like that now. Uh, Ontologic is on working on that and we, we, we know we can, we can do that. I mean, now we have some basic stuff, but uh, I don't want to get into my thing and, and sell myself, but. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm very curious about that. Actually, I'm looking forward to, you know, when you would have a commercial prototype available, but let's talk I, about I have, a, I have a demo online of basic NLP stuff, okay. although not, they're not trivial. I mean, you can test semantic search and analysis and stuff like that, but it's still uh, in the, advanced NLP, not the full NLU yet. Right. Okay. So yeah, we'll be really interested, you know, if you ever have a beta program, just count me in. Um, yes. And let's talk a little bit about uh, cognitive psychology um, and the pedagogical aspect of uh, if language is so simple that four year old can actually understand you can produce language can comply by the instructions and you navigate his way around his uh, little environment. Uh, what is the best way of learning a new language for human beings? And if it's so simple, why is that that it's really hard for a lot of people around the world to uh, acquire a second language? So foreign languages have been yeah. a huge industry itself. So I'm sure that you, um, you're you an expert um, in that field, especially deriving a, a language agnostic model and making it into a mathematical model. You certainly have ideas about this empirical phenomenon. What, what do you think yeah. is missing in our understanding of languages and how we teach that? Right. Uh, although with one uh, caveat, I'm not an expert. Uh, expert is a scary word. But uh, and uh, and by training, I'm not a linguist. Although of course I had to dig deep into language and even cognitive linguistics and psycholinguistics. The issue with second language uh, uh, that's an excellent question because why is it so easy for a kid to pick up the first language? But then it's not just a little bit harder. It's, I mean, qualitatively harder when it comes to a second language. I, from everything I read, it seems like, you know, we, we come uh, uh, not exactly with a blank slate. There's a, and here's where Chomsky was genius in my mind, that there's this language module and it's really as biological as, as the visual system. That, uh, in, in, the, in the evolution uh, of uh, the Homo sapiens, we developed a language module which is really biological. 
that's the huge insight of Chomsky, which I think was great. And that module uh, is uh, is there ready, in a sense, to uh, to start instantiating this beast we call language. So the first language that comes to it owns it, in a sense. I mean, I, uh, that's the best explanation I can, uh, or the best terminology. I can Do you use. think that it's uh, like, it's it, like, it, there's it's like always you, you a have... preference for a human being to dream in only one language better? <laughs> no, it's it's just that the, and and that's why if, 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 uh, if, uh, if a Greek child is born in, in, in San Jose, right, that the first language they will master fully is English, not, not Greek. So it has nothing to do with our biology. There's a language module ready to be owned and instantiated, right? By a linguistic object. It could be English, could be, right? And the, the first language that gets to it sort of owns it, right? Yeah, but let's, and then, and then, let's, and then the second language is sort of like a foreign thing that has to fight what you already instantiated. And something like this made sense to me when I read it and some by some time. Well, let's, uh, let's invert the question. Um, so if someone is already born in San Jose and they lived there for four years, but the rest of their life, they moved to the Middle East and they spoke in Arabic, and then they're going to lose their first language right, right. over time. And, and, that, and that's because that language module hasn't fully been instantiated yet. Don't forget, yes, you can speak at four, at three, four, it depends, but but there's a lot still in the language, more abstract concepts, quantifiers. They don't use them very well in the beginning. You know what I mean? Like we don't use uh, complex phrases or uh, prepositional phrase attachments. So the language module is instantiated, but not fully. It takes some time, right? Because kids don't speak uh, very advanced linguistic. Uh, they don't make very complex linguistic structures when they are still, or especially with abstract stuff, right? So it's sort of like, yeah, if they live four years in, in San Jose and then they move to the Middle East. And so I can imagine a battle going on here, you know, like it's, uh, it's like, okay, I, I instantiated my language module first with Greek, with English say, and, and now there's this, but it's not fully instantiated. And now there's this new thing that's coming and it, it obviously we don't know how it happens, but the first, ex the best explanation I heard about the difference between first and new languages is that this language module this biological organ really uh when it's fully instantiated by some by your first community uh, language it's very hard for a new language now to come in and take your place it's uh, it's a uh, uh, it's an interesting. Uh, well, let's dissect notion. it a little bit more because you know, on the face of it, the argument looks very good. But when you dig deep, you start think, seeing the whole. For example, um, I speak eight languages, so I lived in different places, so I learned different languages. And one of the okay. things that I uh, found out that you know, replacing another language with the previous language kind of depends on the inherent difficulty of the language itself. For example. Um, I speak yeah. Urdu as a native language, which has 39 or 40 alphabets, and that's probably the most comprehensive range of all languages, so it's easier for people to learn and pronounce a lot of other languages that come from the Urdu background. To give you a concrete example, Arabic doesn't have uh, alphabet P. And or, or, uh, or a V. Or a G. Um, so right. you you can actually translate, and I was just wondering what would be a modality for someone who speaks um, um, only Arabic to actually move to Pakistan or any other places where they actually have to pronounce all those uh, syllables. And that would kind of make it harder for them, regardless of what the first language was. And these are the intro cases. I was just wondering. Right, right, right. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, the but but the two are not uh, exclusive, the two, the two notions that that there is this thing that first language is is will have a preference because it owned this blank slate really. That it is. And the fact that learning a new language is also a function of how complex the language is and what sounds you might be missing uh, uh, when you first uh, instantiated your language module. So the two are not uh, mutually exclusive. I mean, they, they're both at work, but 
I think, and there are people that actually master fluently, which amazes me, fluently. And you can hardly know what is their first language. I mean, it, it's amazing. It's a skill that so some people have it. I know people, for example, that, that speak impeccable French and impeccable English and impeccable German at once, right? They can do this, which is, for me, it's like, I don't know. There are people that have special skills or special, you know, it's like uh, some people can do arithmetic with 12 digit numbers on the fly, you know. The human mind is an amazing thing. There are people that have this skill. But generally speaking, generally speaking, the first language that instantiates mm -hmm. the language module uh, becomes sort of like comfortable. That's, it's like, this is mine, eh? You know, the, a new language becomes like a, will always be for it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you put a real effort into it and you have this extra skill. Like I said, we, uh, I mean, I know people that you can't, you can't tell which is their first language. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little about um, from AI perspective, uh, since we're both in the field, how do you actually mathematically make it easier for people for whom language learning or let's say foreign language learning would be a problem? One of the solutions that has been proposed um, is to use um, real time um, language translation, which can be a disastrous um, endeavor also. Uh, so these AR and VR glasses like HoloLens um, or um, Oculus, you know, these um, are to be um, seen as potential um, guides or aids uh, for people who would want to visit another country. But again, we come back to the baseline for um, human communication and it's, it, it's horrible as it is. And that's probably where your idea comes in. And, you know, we're looking forward to what you're able to uh, come up with in terms of accuracy. Do you, do you think that this is a good direction to um, work on? Um, which, oh, and Facebook seems very um, optimistic about that. Um, but I guess, you know, a lot of it is commercial uh, aspect also. Well, but which, which part uh, uh, that... So, for example, if you have glasses um, and you, yeah. you go and you communicate people and you can see the translated version on your glasses and in real yeah. time. Oh, you're, you're, okay. You're referring to real time translation. Yes. Yeah, I, I see it one day happening, but uh, I, it's just that we're too far from. It. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we're, I mean, okay, now translation is, uh, it's like one of my colleagues slash friends, uh, he wrote a paper saying, we're redefining success now. So we're saying Google search is good. I mean, well, it's good if you are willing to live with the noise, but it really, if you dig deep into its actual accuracy, I don't think it's about 60%. Uh, so since when is 60% good? I, I wouldn't go to a doctor that kills 60% of, the 40% of, that's not success in science, but. So we have translation that is okay. It gets the job done. I use it sometimes, right? Uh, so for casual use, like you're a tourist and you know, uh, in the Czech Republic, let's say, and you you see a sign on, you you translate, you take a picture, and then it tells you what it is real time. That's useful stuff. It's good technology. But to uh, to achieve that real time translation, you speak any language. And I just switch from which to which, and I hear it in my language. We're too far from that. Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, let, let's talk. I mean, let me let me play a devil's advocate role here. You know, speaking on behalf and maybe you know covering their uh, side of the story. Which is, what situations would be inappropriate for this kind of um, translation? Because all of these endeavors are made in context with commercial usage. Google does um, the translation for let's say tourists um, or legal document translations um, or uh, flight uh, indicators or simply translating their web pages in English to other languages so that you have wider audiences and then you can more money off of the ads. But what would be the situations in which do you think, you know, that would be um, a bad thing to do? You mean, where, where are, uh, what are examples of the, the almost good uh, translation should not be can, uh, should yes, not be or we should not well, rely on Google Translate and uh, translations uh, in oh, that, those if, situations. Uh, if, I mean, if I have a legal contract or if I'm translating uh, 
medical uh, uh, transcripts. I mean, I, I, I obviously don't want 40% noise. I mean, uh, in any place where it matters that there's life and death or there are contractual things that are serious. I mean, I, I wouldn't uh, take a peace treaty between Russia and, and, and the US and, and, and put it on Google Translate. Uh, you know, the, as it is, even with professional translation, which, which, is, pro, which is actually a very, very uh, special skill. I mean, I, 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 have a, I had an uncle who was a, a translator, a licensed professional translator, and we used to talk because he knew I work in language. The, the, the translation, even if you know two languages very well, you mastered them, syntax, grammar, semantics, rhetoric, uh, all aspects of language, still to get the spirit of the content from one language to the other is a special skill. Uh, so there are many situations where there's no way people can live with the, what we call now statistical neural translation. It's just, again, we go back to probably approximately correct. And in many situations, probably approximately correct is not acceptable at all. And one of the applications um, that has huge adoption, at least in the industry, um, and not only in, ter in terms of technology, but also in other spheres, is sentiment analysis. Um, financial companies actually use it um, to predict stock prices, um, to find out the public sentiment about um, an event or a product or a service. Um, even big tech uses that to censor people uh, who they don't like. Um, so I get um, a lot of Facebook uh, bans um, off and on, and then they just find out on their own that, you know, our algorithm made a mistake and I'm um, banned again. And I was just wondering, do you really think that the sentiment analysis could be biased also? So one of the famous papers by Cynthia Rudy uh, talks about um, how language models um, are biased against African-Americans, not as much as the Caucasians. Um, and do you think that our current understanding yeah. of natural language processing affects the output of sentiment analysis, which is egregiously um, biased and can have severe social consequences. Of course, of course. If, again, if you're, if you're going to use the data-driven paradigm, right? I mean, you know, the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. Our data is biased, right? Our, uh, our unfortunately, we still live in a world where we have a lot of biases, bad stereotypes. And so if that's the core of what uh, I'm inputting to the system, the system's going to be biased, right? I mean, they these were found early on when we started using word embeddings like word to back or glove. Or, uh, the, the, the doctor and male were much closer than doctor and female, but female and nurse, it's stereotyping, right? So because in our text, when we talk about a nurse, we immediately assume a female. So our text is biased and we're going to always have this problem. Uh, real sentiment analysis will, will, will happen when we have real language driven uh, language models that are based on linguistic uh, aspects and semantic aspects and ontological aspects. And, and, and here's, here's a nice thing, actually, I tried to remove bias from word vectors. You can first to some degree, actually, and, and I use that in ontology. Uh, first, you convert word vectors to sense vectors to meaning vectors, because now they are vectors for a word, although the word is very ambiguous. But besides that problem, you could modulate and remove some of the bias in these word embeddings by consulting uh, 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 thesaurus or semantic networks or ontologies of language. And why this is important, because in the data, yes, doctor is associated more with male and nurse with female, but in the ontology, in the, in the type hierarchy of concepts, ma uh, male and female are at the same level. There's no bias in the ontological structure, right? And doctor and nurse are also at the same level and they're equally applicable to male and female. So if you consult ontological structures that don't have human bias, you can modulate the bias in the data a little bit. And, and I've done that in the sentiment analysis that we do at ontology.
But do, can you see a problem that might arise from that endeavor um, as well, which is, for example, if there is no gender uh, bias in doctor, um, there has to be a gender bias between mother and father. So you cannot actually call someone mother when they're male. No, no, that, that's part of the knowledge itself. Right? The, the, by definition, a mother is a female person. So no, no, there's no, there's no problem. And how is the world going to differentiate between if it's an entity um, that has a gender or if that's an entity which doesn't have a gender? Because apparently, for doctor, it didn't discriminate be, uh, between male and female, but for mother, it has to do that. So it's kind of counterintuitive that you know where should I do that or where no, shouldn't no, I do that? Okay, there's a misunderstanding because because uh, uh, the the doctor role is a different role from the mother role. I mean, doctor is a gender neutral uh, role, like lawyer, like uh, like student. A student can have, can be of any gender, but mother, by definition, it has a slot for gender, which is female. I mean, yes, uh, semantically, but you know, how do you implement mathematically? Do you create entity graphs for that, you know, for someone to be yeah, yeah, mother? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, here, I'm assuming that the whole, that the whole approach is different, right? But but basically, when you when you create a sense vector for mother, right, it has the female aspect in it, right? So it will be so basically, mother will be closer to uh, to aunt than to or to to grandmother than to uh man because they're both human female so the the the, the gender uh dimension will be in the vector but in word embeddings it it's really the co-occurrence it's the contextual surrounding of of the words that makes that puts this word in a, in, in in some point in multi-dimensional space say 300 dimension okay but so it's the co-occurrence of the in, in the in the data driven approach, this concept is placed in the space of in the conceptual space based on its surrounding. So, and if the surrounding is not good, it will be not that good. In the ontological approach, it's the nature of concepts that places the concept somewhere. It's 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 what it is. It's what it, it's not a contextual thing, right? Uh, Here's an example. If you, uh, I mean, uh, now uh, take a country like Iran. It's 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 mentioned all the time uh, in the neighborhood of nuclear arms, right? The nuclear deal, the nuclear. So there's some correlation between Iran and nuclear and uh, atomic arms. But that's an accidental similarity. That, that should that's not a linguistic similarity. I mean, 200 years ago, that was not the case. And maybe 10 years from now, that will not be the case. It, it, the, the similarity now in language models is based on noisy, accidental, temporal corpus. data. Uh, it's the corpus, but the corpus doesn't reflect the reality. It's a mm. it reality. Actually, most of the corpus is generated by the Western word itself, like in the amount of output of the news outlets and yeah, the that's newspaper. Yeah, that's another issue. Yeah, <laughs> that's another dimension of the whole part. But I mean, but this data is a snapshot of reality now or probably the past five years. But but that's not the reality of the universe we live in. That's just a temporal uh, a snapshot of reality and a local. Or or a, yes. or a, or a North American mostly because I think most of the content is still U.S. based. Uh, so that will always, if if your approach is always going to be based on the data, then you're always going to be vulnerable to the data. I mean, that's it. one plus one is two. I mean, unless you modulate, like I said, you you can combine the two. You can bring that stuff, and this is what I did in ontology. We there's an advantage to these language models, uh, which is the the recall, right? They, I mean, someone went and harvested the whole web for you, right? And so there's there's good recall, but the precision is bad. So if you do some work on the precision of the vectors, you get the best of both worlds, and that's what we did. 
<laughs> Let's give uh, language a break and uh, talk about um, food. If you only had to eat three foods the rest of your life, what would that be? Whoa. Quite a segue, isn't it? <laughs> uh, actually, the, the, the prospect of that is scary. Three. Uh, uh, could it be a category of food or a specific instance? Like no, a fruit? I mean, category is quite wide, but then you know, the question would be yeah, lost. Fruit, <laughs> uh, fruits, I would pick up few fruits that I can live on. Uh, uh, grapes, apples. Uh, okay, that was a category. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, grapes. Uh, okay. okay, and cheese. Okay. Cheese has, cheese has to be there. And bread. Okay. What kind of cheese do you... Uh, and and actually, the three, the three go together. Okay. Uh, what kind of cheese do you really like? Do you like really I, bitter, smelly kind of cheese or the normal market cheese? I, I like hard uh, cheese and I like uh, blue cheese. I like... Uh, I, I'm a cheese lover, so I, I eat all kinds of cheese. Uh, do you have generally a Mediterranean diet, or uh, are, you, are you more into fat uh, foods? No, I I was in my twenties, early twenties, uh, too much into fast food. But lately, I I do it just to indulge myself once in a while. Like I say, you know, it's been a while and eat junk stuff. This is today is junk stuff, but no, I <laughs> I eat healthy food. I uh, eat uh, uh, Mediterranean is a big uh, item on my menu. Mediterranean food is good food, healthy food. I like Italian food, uh, but I, I'm not uh, a health nut, if you want. Like, I, I don't know, if they, maybe that's a bad word to say, but I, I'm not too, con I, I just eat it because it makes me feel better. I, I, I try to eat healthy stuff as much as I can. This although, is curious. I have, although I have other vices, but. <laughs> Everyone has. Um, I just sort of, I was just curious about what got you interested um, in um, language specifically and computer science in general. I mean, what's your background? I mean, oh, there has to be, you know, a story behind. Um, there is a story. Uh, you know, I come from a culture where uh, uh, you, you had to be either a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer. A mixed two of us. A lawyer is like the, 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 the least you can live with, okay? <laughs> but essentially it was like my son has to be an engineer or a doctor. And that, that, that's a cultural thing. And uh, so, but, but I always loved science and, and math and puzzles and solving problems. So by the time I entered undergrad, computer science was the thing, you know, actually it was more like electronics engineering, you know, it was like, he's going to be an electronic engineer. It was like a big word. Nobody knew what it meant, but it sounds cool, right? Uh, and that shifted to computer engineering, computer science. And so to be honest, I was swept. I, I knew I'm going to do something in science, right? But so I said, okay, computer science sounds good has a little bit of physics and math and computer science and engineering. Well, it sounded good, but I'm not, believe it or not, I'm not this techie guy. I mean, I'm a good coder. I code myself, the, the, the demo online is all my coding. I, I love coding because it's an art for me. So. But I'm not a techie in the sense that I can, you know, uh, build the, net, the best gadget and, and, you know, circuits and stuff. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a systems guy, for example. I'm not, so I enjoyed computer science, the logic part of it, the, 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 the problem solving part, of it. Not, not, not the hardware side of it. That, that part never impressed me. I thought, okay, that, it's cool. I mean, my God, the, the, the hardware engineering, amazing thing. Look where we are now. But it, it, I, I, it never touched me. It was the problem solving, the logic part of it. And uh, I remember I had to take an elective and electives were like senior level courses and they just introduced the course. I looked at the title, I said, what the hell is this artificial intelligence? Uh, so I, I read the description. I don't care, I was stuck with the title, artificial intelligence. So to be honest, I, I, I got into it just out of like curiosity and I was, uh, you know, it sounded too, and I was back then. I was into Star Trek, so it sounded like artificial intelligence. 
and it's, it's the science of building machines that think like humans. So I was just mesmerized by it. I didn't know anything about it. And when I got into my master's, I got into language, logic, and semantics, and I said, oh, God, this is a field that I can spend five lifetimes in and never be bored. That's really what got me into it because it's about the mind and how we reason, cognition. It's like, it's, it'll never be boring. I think and, it's a very- and, and, I, and I like the interdisciplinary aspect of it. I mean, if you're doing, if you are special, if you're doing master's or PhD in, in database systems or distributed computing or what, you can stick with computer science or, or, or mathematics, computer science, but the periphery is very small. But if you want to do a PhD in AI or language, you have to read psychology, linguistics, cognitive science, uh, logic, philosophy. I mean, it's a very interdisciplinary field that really attracted me. I'm very happy that, you know, I get to meet people um, after which I don't feel like oddball myself quite a lot because there are a lot of guests who come to my show, brilliant people like yourself. And this is kind of the um, sticking theme that all of them are magicians in their own way. They're interested in interdisciplinary thing. They're very curious about the word and they don't come from the hard coded um, sciences where they have to do bits and bytes and do the binary programming, which yeah. kind of um, brings me back to the question, how do we actually acquire knowledge and we might be able to actually connect it with the uh, AGI itself. For example, there's a famous book that got me thinking a lot. And the book was, uh, I'm sure that you've read that or have heard of that, it is The Bell Curve, which was quite controversial, uh, written by um, yeah. Charles Murray, um, and talks about um, IQ. And what got him um, in trouble was the fact that he um, said that you know, IQ levels differ between different races. But uh, what got me interested about the fact is that the book, the book's ability to capture the phenomena um, and the speed of getting the answers right is probably the only way we can describe IQs. What do you think that you know um, uh, that mapping yeah, intelligence is possible, or um, because that's in general the essence of AGI? No. Uh, well, two things. First of all, I, I disagree with the with the author of that book. Uh, the, uh, the whole thesis is is not something I subscribe to. Uh, human beings are almost genetically copies of each other. I mean, the environment and the situation of people makes them succeed or not. Plus, I mean, it's very difficult to define uh, what intelligence is. I mean, uh, and uh, I mean, knowledge is another thing, but, but intelligence is really difficult to define. I mean, was Albert Einstein intelligent? I mean, uh, yes. Uh, is he more intelligent than Elon Musk? I think uh, Albert Einstein died. Probably he only owns his home, right? In today's society, we, we don't fall sick. And he certainly could have done a better job with his hair also. <laughs> or, or, or social skills. I mean, sometimes I he, was, he, he was caught uh, doing silly stuff. You know? Like there are pictures for him that he would probably... I'm sure his neighbors that. wouldn't call him smart at all. <laughs> so... But, but you see, like now, for example, and I, I, I wrote a little bit about this, now we're getting into society at large. But uh, now, whatever Elon Musk says about anything, people say he's right, right? Because he's Elon Musk. And where does that come from? It comes from our values have changed. But, but that's the reason why I mentioned Albert Einstein. Back in those days, the Einsteins of the world or Neil Armstrong were the heroes, not the one who's a billionaire, right? I mean, it, 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 we, now Oprah Winfrey and Elon Musk can talk about anything and they're right. I mean, you could be a smart businessman, but that doesn't mean you know AI or, or chemistry or global warming. I mean, you're not a scientist. So, but now the, the, the society at large, uh, yeah, Elon Musk is brilliant. They, they associate wealth with success and because you succeeded that means you're intelligent right and because you're intelligent i should listen to you so the deduction is that the entailment is like this it follows this path if this then this okay and if this then this that's it if wealthy intelligent intelligent he's right so that makes Elon Musk speak about anything medicine covid uh, space AI, you know, although with his autonomous driving, his predictions did not turn out to be so right. 
so intelligence is a hard thing to, to, to define. I mean, if, uh, is a good person who is like an academic who, who yeah, all he did in his life is to manage a nice house. And, uh, he has a beat up car, a uh, smokes pipe, which is bad for, I mean, is that intelligent? I mean, he's smart, supposedly. Why does he do an irrational thing like smoke, right? Uh, but the guy discovered probably half of physics. Uh, is he smart? Is he intelligent? Like, so intelligence, definitely I don't subscribe to the, to the idea that IQ defines intelligence. Uh, because there are people that can do amazing work, but uh, in different scenarios and different contextual uh, settings. Like they, they probably, some can do amazing work, but they have to be left alone for a while. They, they can't, uh, it's hard to really measure intelligence, uh, especially when you, when you put societal metrics on it, like wealth or that's not, uh, so I don't know. I mean, these are big questions, but uh, it's, it's also not the amount of knowledge you have uh, because some people just didn't have that option. Although lately with technology, I think technology is the biggest, I think technology is gonna end up being our savior from ourselves. Uh, so, and we're starting to get there like with the accessibility of technology and knowledge to the whole world. It's becoming uh, one of my previous uh, managers, friend, he's a very good friend, Nagi, he was, a, Nagi Prasad, he was my, the CEO of the company I was with uh, just before Ontologic. He liked the phrase I said uh, that in today's world or very soon, ignorance will start to be uh, an option, uh, uh, a choice. In other words, very soon, if you're ignorant of what's happening in the world, it's your choice. I mean, years ago, that was not the case. People were, just didn't have that chance. But now with two clicks, you can read about any subject and you can become an expert even in many subjects. Knowledge is becoming widespread and free. So uh, it, it's not about intelligence that I, 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 I can't quantify intelligence in any way, but knowledge, yes. Knowledge will be the changing, uh, what will change society to the better in the end. If that's okay. true, then, um, and I'm a very skeptic um, and a strong critic of um, how uh, people are recruited in universities and academia in general, but how do we attract the most smart people around the world? Um, I mean, we certainly have to have some kind of metric um, to evaluate and engage and current admission programs and processes are ridiculous in, in doing that. But we, we have a test like SATs and GMATs and GREs um, who at certain, um, for, to a certain extent does a good job in finding out and screening those people. But if you don't have IQ tests, what would be the most objective metric to do that? For example, it's really hard for people to get into um, these PhD programs and graduate programs with extreme uh, complicated processes, hierarchies, application fees, tuition fees. And you know, you would be missing a lot of brilliant people more possibly Einstein, if you were to put them through this um, tragic um, and probably criminal system, I mean, what would be the best way to find out those people then? Uh, uh, the best way to find them out is not to find them, is to make it available for everybody and stars will, and stars will appear. So uh, I, I don't think uh, you can make any system that's fair. You will always take someone out because they don't fit this test model. I know now they have to do it in a, in a commercially driven world. There, you know, there, there, there's no place for everybody. Uh, but look, I, I, I'm not gonna name names, but I work with people that have PhDs from Ivy League schools. Mm, not what you think. So wh whatever metric they give me, I, I have a counter example. Okay, we need some metrics, so that's why we have those, okay. But the solution is to make, uh, knowledge available for everybody from the Sahara Desert to uh, to uh, uh, the, the highest tip in Mongolia, as well as Sweden, Canada. Uh, uh, everybody should have access to quality education all the way up. 
as long as they want to study, they should have access to uh, quality education. Then stars will be born and you don't have to filter and you don't have to do anything. Yeah, but how do you attract uh, uh, to the center of knowledge? For example, um, there's a book called Price of Admission. 80% of uh, people who are admitted to Ivy League programs, if you were to only hire them based on IQ and standardized tests, they would be Chinese or Indian or Pakistanis. So it's like 20% people would only be you know, admitted to universities if that were based on pure objective ground. And that's unfortunately um, not the case. Um, if you look at the distributions um, at those universities and even the output, research output, you know, Chinese uh, research output in the field of AI has now bypassed uh, the American ones. Right, uh, clearly but, but that's, but, that's uh, but these numbers are misleading. Look, I mean, uh, by sheer volume, right? I mean, uh, if you take the absolute number, yeah, but percentage wise, China drops below Sweden. No, I mean, let, let's, I mean, oh, yes, Chinese research output is more because China is thousand times more than another country, right? So, yes. Yeah, so the output should actually be thousand times more. No, Otherwise, I think we, be... let me clarify something. You know, these are publications in U.S. journals and um, you know magazines and New York IPS and conferences like this. So it's not like we're counting okay. the Chinese journals or. No, 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 no. I know, I know, I know, and I saw this uh, statistics and, uh, but, but. The number of people writing papers, right? I mean, if 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 two if two hundred million people write papers, and I accept only one percent of them, right? There's no way Sweden can be just by sheer volume, right? Uh, look, all, all I'm saying is the quality of research is not more in China than in in Norway or Denmark, not at all. It just happens that these are small countries with three four million people. Where, where the body of Shanghai University alone is bigger, right? All, all I'm saying is all people have the same capability. Any other theory okay, in my then mind, why, why any, is... any other, in my mind, any other theory is, I don't want to use foul language here, but any other theory about genetics and racism and is, 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 let me use the word ridiculous, okay? I don't, I don't want to go more than that towards vulgarity but okay. this is this has been proven this has been proven i mean at some point the persians uh, uh, and the arabs uh, uh, defined logic and algebra and at some points uh, it came out of india and china so it has been proven that all races have it within them based on the conditions to uh, to uh, shine and 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 create and be brilliant right it has been proven that is a factual fact all over the earth. There's no society that didn't at some point create something amazing. It's just about the opportunity. And that's why I think the fairest system will be in the end, let all have access to quality education and let the world, uh, stars will be born from this, from Sudan, you will have someone, from uh, Norway, you will have someone, from Kazakhstan. So I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the theory that uh, Okay, this is how the world works now. Some people don't have the opportunity, some do. Uh, and some don't have the money. It's unfortunate that in the US, for example, if you're, uh, especially that, you know, it's, it's a wealthy nation, it should afford education to all its people. We're, we're losing things, uh, we're losing uh, potential brilliant people, right? Uh, there was a saying that civil rights movement had, which I love, a mind is a, ter a terrible thing to waste. So every, every time you're not giving an opportunity to someone, you're probably missing, uh, you know, another Galileo, you know, who knows? Or it okay. doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be in science, it could be the, the it could be the next uh, Mozart, you know, if they got into music. Or Sure, I'm, I guess, you know, they will find eventually a way to display their talents, uh, especially in the connected world that we are living in. But let's get to some to uh, some of uh, the most uh, interesting um, topics that um, are trending um, in AI, and one of b them being unsupervised learning. Um, the problem with uh, supervised learning is that there's only so much that you can do. And when you have data yeah. amounting to petabytes and uh, terabytes you certainly do not have the manpower to um, label the, that data 
and super unsupervised learning comes with own, its own problems. And I was just wondering, um, you certainly work with the NLP and with the corpus is huge and probably most prone to human errors. Uh, what would be a mathematical way of uh, applying a technique which would do a good job when it comes to unsupervised learning of um, that corpus? Right. Uh, first of all, um... I'm suspicious of uh, the, the whole paradigm. Uh, and uh, although it, it has its place in, in, in some places, but it can succeed in places where you can run simulations, where uh, in a sense you're inventing data, you're, you're inventing uh, situations to, to experiment with. So to do trial and error and learn by that. Th there are places, so for example, in game playing, uh, that's that's a perfect situation where I can simulate many games and keep training you. And there's a clear objective where you can uh, try to maximize, right? In this case, winning. So if I if I let the machine play uh, 10 million games and it will uh, over time with a with a clear objective, it will over time figure out the best path to win. That's a perfect paradigm. But again. If, if, if we have a hammer and it's a good hammer, we shouldn't use it to comb our hair, right? So again, this is where extremism comes in, okay? Uh, so, so for example, DeepMind just wrote a paper that I criticized vehemently and I proved that, this, this, again, big claims are being, they're not being questioned now in academia. And I was disappointed that it was published in one of the top journals that I used to respect, That's, I still do, but. I couldn't believe how could this paper be published just because it's deep mind. The title is reward is enough. In other words, maximizing an objective function uh, and uh, uh, giving a reward to the system as a reinforcement is enough to explain all in AGI, right? But that's completely wrong, mathematically, scientifically. Uh, even the, even the, even the, uh, the, actually I'm in the process of preparing uh, to write a book because there are so many issues at a high level that are misunderstood that should really be the ABC before you get into AI. Like these are facts guys. You can't, you can you can do so much with, uh, guessing, but you can't guess over facts. The the reward is enough or the reinforcement paradigm has its limits. Like I said, in game playing, the objective is well-defined. Like when you have a goal, then you have an objective to achieve that goal. And so reward is a definable thing, but reward is not always defined. It's actually not defined in many issues in life, in many problems. There is no reward. There's no objective even, there's no goal, right? And I gave examples in one paper that the objective is not computable. So you cannot, there is no meaningful reward. So the whole paradigm doesn't even apply. Uh, so it is, a, it is a useful paradigm. It is a useful technology that has its place. Like I said, in problems where two things, the space is finite, no matter how big. And there's a clear objective. Thus, you can define a reward computationally. Uh, okay, in that paradigm, you can keep training until you maximize your objective, and uh, okay, then you will uh, you will have you will improve performance. But that doesn't apply in all situations, not at all. Uh, so, it's a long answer to it is a powerful thing, right? But it's limited to specific problems. I'm glad you brought this up because, you know, the idea of reinforcement learning actually comes from a field of psychology, especially the experimental psychology, where you could actually do Pavlovian experiments on dogs right. and, you know, mold their behaviors based on rewards. But the problem is that it does not yeah, translate you, to human beings. Should, right. Well, then you should be probably aware of the debate that went on for years between Skinner and, uh, and yes. Chomsky and others. Uh, and I keep using this phrase whenever some some people mention Skinner. I say Skinner has been skinned a long time ago. Uh, That's a good one. He, yeah, and and he has actually. There's a Dan Bennett who is uh, 
a great philosopher. Uh, he has a, a paper, uh, the title is Skinning Skinner. And they actually skinned him. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theory that applies, but in very, very limited uh, situations. So, and typically you have food, I think. Okay, animals and food, right? Okay, so uh, you can train animals by giving them, you know, so they did it on rats by giving it cheese and of course, okay. But to, to make that, uh, to, 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 to take that paradigm to explain all human behavior, uh, I smoke, right? What is the reward here? I, I, what, what is my objective? I like to die of cancer. I mean, Human behavior is more complex than yes. just give it, give it a cheese. I think there was. Yes. I, if, if you if you want to explain animal behavior, okay, probably probably animal behavior is mostly by reward and maximizing reward because their goals are very limited: food, shelter, right, and and survival, right. So many animals have developed things over uh, the year, thousands of years to to achieve those three goals shelter, food, and survive, okay. But to take that to human cognition, I mean, uh, Van Gogh likes to, to bleed when he cut his ear. Human behavior is so complex that sometimes it's the opposite of reward. We don't want a reward, like we want something else. Right? So, uh, but, but mathematically now going back to AI, you can prove easily that this contradicts basic science. There are many problems where the reward is not even definable because the search space is infinite. So you don't know what your goal is. You, there's no winning state because the winning state is not even defined, right? There's a mathematics behind it. You can do that when the state space of searching is well-defined. You can score each one like in Go. You can score all the boards and you can uh, see if uh, this board will maximize your reward. It's well defined. But there are many problems where the goal is not even defined. How do you assign, how do you assign an objective function to measure something that you don't know where it is? I think so, we can agree but, on the fact that, uh, you know, this probably is good for situations which are structured very well. For example, one of the applications for that is uh, financial markets. Um, so they do something called microtransactions. And there was a paper published which was very insightful and it talks about two algorithms actually colluding with each other to keep their price up. Um, so the algorithms learn over time to actually help each other to keep their prices up, creating some kind of monopoly and all based on deep neural um, networks. But when you apply that uh, to human um, settings, and I'm surprised that B.F. Skinner actually got that famous because it's such a ridiculous idea and they used it for some at some point for price setting uh, and in business psychology environment also. We had a wonderful discussion in undergraduate program and I was uh, teaching into the psych. Um, to these um, people and you know for 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 the most uh, people it was very obvious at some point he also claimed that if you give me a child um, and leave him for four years um, with me I'm going to train him whatever you want him to be and you know yeah. that that could be you know a really ridiculous statement coming um, um, at least from a scientific perspective but that brings me to another question which is very interesting how do you actually animals learn language um, or let's say they, they communicate with their um, hu human masters. For example, there are, there's a viral lecture by Robert Sapolsky at Stanford where he talks about human behavioral biology. And he talks about the um, endocrine uh, processes that we share with uh, the other mammals. Yet language is not one of them. But where do you think, is it like the Maslow hierarchy's top level of self-awareness? They don't have that and rest of them uh, we share with them. Why is that that they don't share the language component um, of our similarities, um, but the rest of that, you know, we're quite similar. Why do they miss the language? Yeah, so I mean, where does that come from? Uh, okay, I, I mean, there are many theories, but there, the, at some point, Homo sapiens developed. There was a, and it wasn't an incremental thing. I mean, it, at some point. Uh, there was a biological accident. Many people uh, claim it happened around 200,000 years ago that, and apparently it came with, uh, with the thinking, the, the, 
thinking became apparent that we started to create tools and we started to be uh, smart in how we uh, make shelters. And so it, language and thought came together at some point. Uh, nobody ever suggested they know how and what, what that spark was. Uh, but uh, I agree that that's the only thing that is obviously unique about us from animals and that gave uh, that and, and and language apparently doesn't come on its own it's a package that comes with reasoning and thinking and now we know that to to really do language understanding there's a thinking process so those two came together uh how and why uh, that that's beyond me i i don't even know that anybody knows uh, in the literature has any we are any, thinking uh, in terms of the Neuralink uh, initiative by Elon Musk when you can actually um, teach monkeys to learn games based on reinforcement but why couldn't actually be done uh, that's the similar thing could be done for the language learning I mean they certainly have the vocal cords they resemble a lot with human beings when it comes to skull structure the uh, mouth uh, you know nerves um, and the facial nerves everything else why not that okay. right it's uh, yeah again that's the big question I, I mentioned this the other day to a couple of friends who were discussing language and I said if because many people speak about the environment and and the role of the environment. Yes, of course, the environment has a big role. And, uh, but even if you put a chimpanzee with, with, uh, with you or live in the house for, and like your kids, they're going to hear the same words, they're going to hear the same music, gonna, they will not speak. They're missing, and this is the genius of Chomsky, I think. There is a biological component that is missing. This is not just, that's, that's the big, uh, I think, insights from Chomsky, although I'm not a Chomsky in all the way, but uh, it is a biological organ that is missing. It's, it's as if uh, some animals don't have a visual system they would never see. They don't have this biological organ, right? So language is not this abstract skill that is similar to riding. I mean, you can teach some animals how to ride a bicycle. Uh, I mean, right? Uh, it's not a skill. It's a biological organ that's missing. And you can't, if that organ, if that machinery is not there, you can't make it, right? So it's as simple as that. Uh, and that's where I think, so it's not just a skill that can, the mind can acquire. No, it's, there's a, there's a biological organ that can handle language that came to be at some point. That's a big question now, but it's like the uh, vision. Uh, if you don't have it, if you don't have that visual machinery that you're not gonna see. Same with language, animals don't have it, simple. So yeah, they, they do have a communication system, which is different, a limited vocabulary. Uh, th this goes back to the, the human mind was able to handle recursion inductive structures and infinite objects we we can handle infinite objects in a finite domain in a finite body right animals don't have that capacity animals have a limited vocabulary a small hash table and it's one to one there's no composition we do composition that uh, is productive jerry porter calls it it produces an infinite number of possibilities i mean the number of thoughts i can have is infinite and thus the number of sentences we can make is infinite. That, that abstract model, that abstract recursive machinery doesn't exist in animals. They have a limited uh, dictionary of sound and it's one-to-one, -one. there's no composition here. And this is what I tell people, you know, it's like, uh, especially computer scientists, like how, how could you believe, you know, like uh, formal languages, programming languages are, are much, uh, I mean, human languages are much richer in complexity technically in the, in, the, in the language hierarchy. Can you use machine learning to create a Python compiler, for example? Let's say I give you, I give you 100 million, and it's easy enough to get 100 million working Python programs as input 
to the train, right? It's easy. We can get 100 million easy. We can even generate many of them. And I can give you also, I can permit, uh, do some permutation on them and make them not workable. And I can give you another 100 million of wrong programs. And before even you try to learn the semantics and execute the program, there's no one that can do this and tell me now I have a neural network that learned what a correct Python program is and why. Some, one word, infinity. A Python compiler is ready for an infinite number of programs. It doesn't say, oh, I, although this is a correct program, a program, but this one I cannot do, that, right? And that's what many computer scientists miss. And when I talk about natural language, they, they tell me, but we don't speak an infinite number of things. We're finite. That's not the problem. I know we're finite and I know we don't speak an infinite number of things, but we have to be ready for anything to understand. And any here is infinite. So our, our language module is ready potentially for how many? An infinite, right? You know, and, when and I they, one of the breakthroughs, I mean, I'm very happy you brought this up that, you know, what are these um, nuances in um, human behavior and animal behaviors that are actually engender um, these thoughts. But, and one of the breakthroughs in uh, personality psychology actually comes from the usage um, of language, how people uh, express their feelings, um, their emotions and, and their fears. And that's one of the most replicable phenomena in the history of um, psychological experiment, which is the big five personality model. Uh, so, but they found out that, you know, the language that you use to express, like vocabulary range that you use, the prosody, these are tied to the genetic um, origins um, of people. And there are five main differences between people. This is called the ocean model, which is the openness um, to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and narcissism. And on a broader level, these are, oh, the differences in which people uh, in which people differ from each other for for example you and me we might have different skin color height fat ratio bone structure and things like this but these are genetic differences or uh, say the, the genotype but then the phenotype is uh, totally different which is based on environment language uh, the education and that expresses itself in language and when we use this test and we have multicultural multi-age, multi-country samples for over 100 years now. Um, American Army started that in 1950 in the research itself. And now we have gotten to the point that it is the industry standard for hiring people, uh, at least in Fortune 500 companies, 80% 80, 80 companies do some kind of psychometric test to do that. And I was just wondering, do you also, um, in, in your research um, or in your thought process, um, have you thought about the fact that, you know, the expression of um, uh, the expression of um, feelings um, and um, ideas and, and the words used can actually be used to classify different kinds of people. And you know, if that could be useful uh, for a commercial purpose because that's what we do um, in our company. That we, the clustering becomes a lot easier once you understand the expression of these people. And I'm just wondering, uh, is that a line that you have thought on? Uh... No, but I'm aware of uh, classifying people, uh, people profiling people based on uh, the language, their language. There, uh, there are, there, are, there are techniques where you can, to a certain degree of accuracy, predict who the author is, if you want. Like we, there, people, some people speak in a certain way and in a certain style. But beyond that, to I think it becomes dangerous. I, I don't know to to make uh, to make uh, to make to, to to make judgments based on how people speak or write. Uh, I think you're entering a shady. Well, there's no judgments to be made because you know it's not used to actually make decisions. Um, but to actually help people out, you know, for example, in counseling um, sessions, at least in high school level or in clinical settings, you can identify people and find out where they land on an introversion, extroversion spectrum. And then, you know, if there are diseases that are more likely to be based on introversion or extroversion, you can actually help them out and give them better care. So there's no judgment made, like a, a political or social or 
um, a legal judgment based on that, but that's certainly a good framework to understand people from a positive, constructive yeah, point I'm, of view. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. Of, I, I, I don't know much about this work, and I don't know how uh, how accurate uh, and reliable it is. Uh, it's actually one of the most replicable um, tasks um, in the history of um, oh. psychology, along with the um, the monozygotic um, twin experiment. Um, and big five and you know a couple of other things so that was one of the most replicable ones but my idea was that you know do you think that can some point be um used in um, nlp models also for based on um the corpus of different people for example i know already that ibm watson um they have this uh, cognitive uh, component and if you put text from one person so example if i put your medium article and put that um, in that um, engine is going to give me uh, the prediction of what kind of personality this person has, you know, based on the complexity of the vocabulary and the length of the article and prosody. Do you think that it, it's something that... I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious. Uh, I, I Look, in the end, uh, this is a classification problem. You, know, you, okay. you can... And uh, yes, you can do classification based on uh, to some degree of accuracy, but uh, based on language, because you can do it based on many things. I mean, that's because it's one of your outputs. It's one of your cognitive products, right? So it, it, it's a projection of what's the, uh, what you have in your mind. So it, it tells you something, but how granular uh, is your uh, profiling? I, I don't know. At, at some point, I think you you go too far. I mean, you can do broad classification, right? I mean, uh, it, it's sort of like sentiment analysis, also. Like you can you can profile at, at a very broad, uh, but I don't know how deep you can. I I, I don't know how uh, valuable uh the information you can get uh, beyond just classification like uh, and profiling. how is that different from medical diagnosis uh it's different because medical diagnosis gets to the the, to the data i mean it it uh it uh, i mean if you if you have this this and that then science says that's probably what's going on Right. Exactly. That's exactly that also. So if you have those symptoms and then you you have a medical history and then you have a family history, then it's more likely that you had have that. So it's it's not very different from medical one. But I was just thinking if there is a mathematical way of uh, getting it out from the corpus. Um, but I guess that there, there will certainly be a lot of uh, work needed um, before we actually can establish that. But one of the questions, that what, which, which one of your papers are you most proud of? Uh... Uh, it has to be the one that I got the Outstanding Paper Award on in Germany in okay. 2008. That's where I explained the adjective ordering mystery. I, I explained what's happening and there is no mystery. It was a good paper. Uh, uh, it's, what, it's specific to one problem, but... Uh, I am proud of it because it explained a problem that has bewildered linguists for decades. Okay, and then yeah. now that you are trying to implement that commercially, um, also, uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, would that be mathematically easy, also, or it's just like a theoretical framework at the moment? No, no, it's uh, computational. Even it's not anymore, uh, but it's a very elegant system where there's no hacking. Once you know that that what's happening, then you don't need to do any hacking. It's a system. Uh, there's a system underneath, and it works like a clock. I mean, it uh, it just needs time and resources. That's what I'm doing actually now is uh, trying to find the best way to build this. But uh, so far, it, I mean, uh, that's the business side of it. But this the theory is very elegant, and it's. Uh, 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 it's a lot simpler than what we thought. Let's put it this way. But but again, I'm, I'm I, I want to define uh, really what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about uh, the, the, right now. The goal is very humble, uh, as difficult as it is. It's very uh, very 
well defined. It's basically question answering, but in a human like dialogue where you get the answer to the question, uh, which we don't have anything close to right now. I mean, all the chatbots and Google Assistant and Alexa, uh, you can trick them with one question and you can see that they really don't do any understanding. So as, as well defined as the problem is, it's still big, but it doesn't uh, go beyond that. So this is not about AGI, this is not about, you know, even even it's not about the full language problem because language uh let me define that if, if i read a book right i i learned something from it obviously what do i store i store not the entire not every entity relationship i read in every sentence i store the gist of it what is that just how do, how do i how, when i say i learned something when i read this book what exactly is the new knowledge that I saved? A summary of it? What, what kind of representation? You see what I'm getting at? And that's also a language problem that's beyond what I'm doing. Right now, it's simply question answering in a human-like dialogue. Although I'm making it sound, it's not much, but it's very, very difficult and it doesn't exist anywhere. Do so you a, also have a memory retention problem that you know most of those long language models have? Do you, do you have tackled that as well for the long term yeah. memory so that it recalls what has been said before? Right. You have to have this, and you have to have short term, long term. Short term even has a short, short term, all the, all the way to a conversation has its own context where it's stored all, it, it's like on a stack of memory. It's the it's the kind of memory, if you want. And then you go to short term and then longer, longer, longer. It's a stack of memories. And we do this for reference resolution. We do this to, to sh switch context from one context to the other. Right. But did you think that in terms of big, big old notation, that would be computationally very, very expensive when it goes to petabyte size? Uh, if, if you're doing data driven, did you say annotation? Yeah, but, but what I'm trying to say is that, you know, when the data gets a humongous, on a humongous level, then, you know, recalling back to the first sentence, that's going to be computationally very expensive um, as well. Do you also have right, taken... Right, right. No, no. And, and, and we humans don't do that. Uh, we, we don't refer to sentences that were said five minutes ago. We, we, we might recall and restart and uh, uh, reintroduce the subject. But even humans don't do that. They don't store because uh, computationally it becomes not defined. Like what? Like uh, if I say uh, uh, those, you're going to tell me those who? Like you, we, we don't just wildly. Language is more systematic than we think. We we don't make references to things that I said yesterday. No, no. Language is not that wild. Uh, uh, the, and, and there are studies that were made that we keep six or seven things in short term memory, no more. Humans can't, uh, it becomes undefined, like what are you talking about? Uh, language is not that wild. Language is more systematic and formal than we think. Do you have a timeline on when we can expect to see that? Uh, as soon as I get some more support, that's what I'm in the process of getting now, getting support to, uh, I mean, uh, I need human resources, which cost money. Like right now, it's a small effort for this. Uh, I, I should have, we should have something in a year, uh, which will be uh, the demo that I keep telling everybody about, like that's the benchmark you should have, not you create your own data set and beat your own data and beat your own numbers. You should have a benchmark, like here's a database that is about, uh it's it's the atlas of the world it's geography mountains oceans rivers capitals whatever population uh ask it questions so uh, that that's the first thing we're, we're gonna do put it online uh engage in a dialogue and ask questions because the, the, where where does the dialogue come in because the the conversational agent sometimes might ask questions to disambiguate your still vague question. So it might, it, we call it clarification, but 
So if my query was too vague, the agent might say, did you mean this? So it will be a real human-like dialogue where you can ask questions and get the right answer, which is something that doesn't exist anywhere. GPT-3 might spit out stuff that looks cool for you, but it's doing search. It figured out that what you're saying is related to this. There's no understanding. The, the understanding test will be, can I ask the question? If you understood, then I should be able to ask you a question and answer. That's understanding. Everything else is language processing. It's not language understanding. Uh, or it's not even language processing. It's text processing. You're processing, bit, uh, you're, you're processing bit sequences, like as if they were pixels. Um, well, it's been wonderful talking to you. Such a fascinating conversation, you know, uh, challenging a lot of paradigms that actually rule the industry at the moment. And, you know, it's, it kind of looks like a broken record to talk about all these um, so-called interventions um, without actually having someone and talk about, hey, you know, stop this, you know, it doesn't make sense. And you're the kind of person who actually, you know, calls out the BS um, in a lot of the things. And um, uh, I admire you for that a lot that, you know, there are some people who are talking about um, reality from the fiction. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll have yeah. you at some point in the future. Also, I'm super excited to, you know, look at your engine once in doubt. Thank you. I enjoyed this. And uh, I'll definitely let you know. <laughs> thank when you. When we have something. Thanks.